Some Light Podcast. This program contains preaching and teaching from an Orthodox Christian perspective to help you in your walk with Jesus Christ and to be victorious in Him. Well, welcome to the show. I'm your show host, Dr. Al Mams. This is the Old Gladsome Light Radio Show on W4CY.com, your internet radio around the world 24 7. Also, uh, the slogan for this show is Preparing Souls for Heaven. Preparing Souls for Heaven. The show is blessed by Metropolitan Michael of the International Orthodox Church. We are also doing a simultaneous broadcast on K4HD in Hollywood, California and W4VET. The show topic today is called The Blame Game. The Blame Game. So. Have you ever been? Uh, have you ever ex- experienced that being blamed for something or blaming somebody for something? Well, remember the old glass and light radio show uh, exists for basically one reason, and that's to bring knowledge to the faithful. And uh, I'm trying to do that. And today is probably a um, a subject that uh, all of us need to listen to, and also maybe change our thoughts, our, our process of thinking, and. Uh, you know, it's easy to say, well, he or she did that, uh, I blame you, or you get blamed for something. So that, that game, I guess you could, that's why I call it a blame game, the game is going on today. And uh, we see it all throughout the, our humankind around the world. People are blaming each other for stuff. So I'm going to jump right into this uh, t- show topic, the blame game, and, and uh, hopefully... Uh, We'll get some knowledge out of this, uh, glean some knowledge out of it, and make some changes into, into our life, into our very uh, spirit and soul, and be uh, better Christians. That's where our, my goal is, is to be uh, approved of God. So blaming others for our faults and problems is unjust, cruel, and displeases God. When things go wrong, we tend to look around for someone that we can hold responsible for our difficulty. In the book of Exodus, we read that the children of Israel did this in the wilderness shortly after their deliverance from the land of Egypt. Remember, they were slaves. They were making bricks for Pharaoh. And when they left, uh, God in a miracle way through the Passover led them out of bondage into the wilderness. Well, when they got out to the wilderness, they encountered a shortage of water and saw they didn't have enough food. So they panicked and blamed Moses and Aaron for getting them into this predicament. But the whole Israelite community complained against Moses and Aaron in the wilderness. That's number 16, verse 2. They made scapegoats of their leaders and the very leaders who had risked everything to bring them out of bondage and slavery so maybe their hearts were still in Egypt because they had enough food they had enough water they had a roof over their head but God didn't want that he led them out into the wilderness so they'd be free so uh, God mercifully overlooked their lack of faith and unfair criticism of the servants in these two incidents but when the Israelites later committed the same sin. He judged them severely. Numbers 21. God sent fiery serpents. Uh, let me read that passage out of the scripture out of Numbers uh, 21, starting at 21 4. Then they set out from Mount Hor by the way of the Red Sea to go around the land of Edom, and the people became impatient because of the journey. And the people spoke against God and Moses. Why have you brought us up out here in, from Egypt to die in the wilderness? For there's no food, no water, and we loathe this miserable place. Or I should say we loathe this miserable food, a provision that God gave them. And the Lord sent fiery service among the people, and they bit the people so that many of the people of Israel died. So when the people came to Moses and said, We have sinned because we have spoken against the Lord and you 
intercede with the Lord that he may remove the serpents from us. And Moses interceded for the people. Then the Lord said to Moses, Make a fiery serpent and set it on the standard, and it shall come about that everyone who is bitten and who looks at it shall live. And Moses made a bronze serpent, set it on the standard, and it came about that if a serpent bit any man, when he looked to the bronze serpent, he lived. So that's the account of the number uh, 21 on the, on the brass serpent or the bronze serpent that God ordered Moses to make. And uh, those who were bitten by, by the serpents, they repented, looked upon the, the, fiery, the, the bronze serpent and were, were healed. They were healed. Now, I'm going to talk about in a few moments Adam and Eve in the Garden of Eden and what happened there. And we know that uh, they, they sinned against the Lord. And then after they were, had the, their eyes were opened, it says the scripture, and they find out they were hiding. They made fig leaves and they were hiding out. And God was walking in the cool of the day, looking for them. And then they, uh, they started to say, uh, well, what have you done? God says to them, what have you done? Have you eaten of that truth, that tree that I told you not to eat of? And then they started the blame game too. So we have see the Israelites are blaming Moses and God in Numbers 21, but also we see uh, Adam uh, and Eve blame Eve blames a serpent. Uh, Adam blamed uh, Eve, and it even said, "The woman you gave me." So uh, this this did God uh, capitulate to that blame? No, it was severe. They were tossed out of the Garden of Eden. And uh, these, God sent a, an angel with a fiery sword to guard the entrance so they could never come back in. But Jesus Christ even compared himself to that serpent, uh, that brown serpent that he says, as a serpent was lifted up in the wilderness, so I will be lifted up and draw all men unto me. And those people, those men and women that look upon me uh, in, in faith and trust what I have done, uh, shall be saved. It's, uh, I'm paraphrasing the scriptures here. So, uh, it says the serpent bit Adam in the Garden of Eden. Edom. The serpent bit Adam in the Garden of Eden. His venom eventually caused him to die physically and decay in the grave. Now, he didn't physically bite him, but his, his, they had a mind, they had a conversation, they had a debate, and Eve was debating with the serpent and, and Adam bought into that, that whole deal, and they both, I call it, got a mind virus. They got a mind virus, and we hear a lot about the virus today in this world, a pandemic, uh, corona, and so forth, but I'm talking about a mind virus, that uh, your mind is clouded, it's not functioning correctly, it's like an eight-cylinder engine not hitting on all eight cylinders, it's running rough. Well, um, Adam's brain was running rough. Because remember, the covenant was made with Adam, not Eve. He made covenant with Adam. And then he says he gave Eve as a helpmate, a woman, out of the side of Adam. That's what that was all about. So so after, you know, uh, this, you know, the serpent being the most subtle and wise of all creatures in the garden, really the enemy, convinced Eve to do the, her deed, and she convinced Adam to do uh, to join her, and they, they were found out. The Lord found them out. And there was no repentance at all. There was a blame game going on in the Garden of Eden. And they're blaming God. Can you imagine that? So, as soon as Adam ate of the, of the violated the commandments, they ate, ate of that, that fruit, he died, spiritually died. But it took him uh, physically 930 years before he would physically die. So it says in Romans 5.12, death also came in the world through the first Adam. But life comes to the world through the second Adam, that be Jesus Christ. Okay, so I'm going to talk more about that in a moment. Now the brass serpent in the wilderness Save those who looked upon it, not because it lived, but because it was killed. And killed with its power that was subject to it, being destroyed as it deserved. And so what fitting epitaph for it from us? 
O death, where is thy sting? O grave, where is thy victory? That comes out of 1 Corinthians chapter 15, 55, but it also is part of the catechetical sermon of St. John Chrysostom, which we read every Pascha. O death, where is thy sting? O grave, where is your victory? You are overthrown by the cross. You are, you are slain by him who was the giver of life. You are without breath, dead, without motion, even though you keep the form of the serpent lifted up high on a pole. And that comes from Gregory the theologian. But I'm going to give you some key information today on how to be at peace with God, how not to let anybody or anything remove your peace and maintain your peace with God. It's very important because Jesus says, I give you peace that the world cannot understand. So we need to remember, however, that when we blame others for our own problems, we are not only hurting the innocent victims towards whom we point our accusing fingers, but ourselves as well. By blaming others, we fall, fail to acknowledge our own personal failures and thereby, thereby rob ourselves of the opportunity to repent, to learn from our mistakes and to ask for help. Well, pride gets in there, the ego gets in there, so, you know, you know, you know proud people, I know proud people. But the repentance is the key of salvation, it's the means of salvation. As we say in our divine liturgy, repentance is the means of salvation. The moment we blame another for something which is our personal responsibility, and I'm going to talk a little bit about personal responsibility in a moment. We do nothing less than condemn ourselves to repeat that same mistake. When we see things more clearly, we, be, we come to understand that no person stands taller in the sight of God and of his fellow man than one does, than the one who acknowledges his error who asks for forgiveness and expresses a need for help lest the mistake be repeated over and over again. No person ever won a victory in the personal struggle for spiritual perfection by pointing a finger in the direction of another. I often thought when you point your finger at somebody, you have three coming right back at you. Think about that for a moment. We are told However, that acceptance of personal responsibility, even for a small error in judgment, causes all of the heavenly hosts to rejoice on our behalf. If we must point a finger, therefore, let it be at ourselves. Point this way. As I was growing up, my parents taught me about personal responsibility. You are, you are responsible for your actions. Don't slough it off. Don't blame other people. You take personal responsibility for your actions. Is that happening today? Or are people just want to cascade it down and blame others and feel like they're free? Really, they're putting themselves in prison by doing that. And so this, is, this message uh, is for us to grow in Christ. Be approved of God. I want a church... I got some of the church father quotes here. I'd like to read a couple of them to you. In the beginning, envy is re revealed through inappropriate zeal and rivalry, and later by fervor with spite and the blaming of one who is envy. That came from St. Ambrose of Optina. Another one. God said to Adam, In the day that thou eatest of it, that is, of the forbidden tree, Thou will die the death, that's Genesis 2.17. That is the death of the soul. See, and not a physical death, but the death of the soul. This happened immediately. Man was stripped of the garment of immortality, so that makes death, the separation of soul and body, an unnatural process. But we all think it's a natural process. Well, not in the beginning. It was, it was an unnatural process. God said nothing more than that decree, nor did anything special happen after that. God, foreseeing that Adam was to sin, because he's omniscient, omnipresent, and desiring to forgive him if he repented, did not say anything more than the above. But Adam refused to acknowledge his sin and did not repent even when he was accused by God. For he said, The woman whom thou gavest to, to be with me, she deceived me. Genesis 3.12 
O woe to his blinded soul, saying this, he as it were said to God, Thou thyself art guilty, because the woman whom thou gavest me has deceived me. This very same thing I myself now suffer wretched and miserable, when I do not desire to be humble and to say with my whole soul that I myself am guilty of my perdition. But on the contrary I say, on the contrary I say, that person over there inspired me to do this or say this. He advised me and knocked me off the path. Woe is my poor soul which speak such words filled with sin. Almost shameless and irrational words of a shameless and irrational soul. Adam and Eve now have a fallen will and trying to hide from God. The fallen man now has a fallen will, thus he has a tendency to run away from God. That's why they made the fig leaves, that's why they're hiding in the bushes. But the grace of Christ heals the will of those who return to Him through repentance. So they might freely pursue God and do His will. And that comes from St. Simeon, the new theologian. And, and uh, these quotes from the church fathers are precious gems and, and pearls that, that the church has given us uh, in their writings. Uh, one from John uh, Climacus. He who wants to overcome the spirit of slander should not ascribe the blame to the person who falls, but to the demon who suggests it. For no one really wants to sin against God, even though we do all sin without being forced to do so. That's St. John Climacus. Another quote. Oh, brethren, what is the result of pride? Oh, see that what humility can do? What was the need for all these sufferings? For if from the beginning man had humbled himself, obeyed God, and kept the commandment, he would have not fallen. Again, after his fall, God gave him an occasion to repent and to receive mercy, but he kept his stiff neck held high. He came to him and said, Adam, where are you? Instead of saying, what glory you have left and what dishonor you have arrived at, after that, he asked him, why did you sin? Why did you transgress the commandment? By asking these questions, he wanted to give him the opportunity to say, forgive me. However, he did not ask for forgiveness. There was no humility, there was no repentance, but indeed the opposite. He answered, the woman whom you gave to be with me, Genesis chapter 3, verses 9 through 12, he did not say the woman deceived me, but the woman whom you gave me, as if he wanted to say, this catastrophe has come upon me because of you. So it is, brethren, since man is not accustomed to blame himself, he does not hesitate to consider even God the cause of evil. Pretty, uh, pretty bold, isn't it? Pretty bold that uh, that kind of thought process uh, was coming forth. Then God came to the woman and said to her, Why did you not keep the commandment? As if he wanted to, to say, At least you say, Forgive me, so as to humble your soul and to receive mercy. Again, there was no request for forgiveness. She also answered, The serpent deceived me, Genesis 3.13. As if she wanted to say, If the serpent sinned, where is my mistake? Blaming others. Remember this topic. The blame game. And it's a horrible game. Why do you act in this way, you pitiful ones? Make a vow of repentance, recognize your fault, be sorry for your nakedness. Neither one of them could blame himself. Neither one of them had the least bit of humility. And that comes from the church father, St. Dorotheus. A quote from St. Anthony the Great. This is the great work of man, always to take the blame for his own sins before God and to expect temptation to his last breath. St. Anthony agreed. One more quote from St. Maximus the Confessor. 
when a trial comes upon you unexpectedly, do not blame the person through whom it came, but try to discover the reason why it came. And then you will find a way of dealing with it. For whether through this person or through someone else, you had in any case to drink the wormwood of God's judgment. I'm going to uh, take this pause for a moment and read a quote from uh, St. Basil the Great about this very, uh, in, uh, very moment of, of this paragraph from St. Maximus. St. Basil the Great said, Do not say this happened by chance while this came to be of itself. In all that exists there is nothing disorderly, nothing indefinite, nothing without purpose, nothing by chance. How many hairs are on your head? God will not forget one of them. Do you see how nothing, even the smallest thing, escapes the gaze of God? So God is, uh, you know, He knows. He knows everything here that's going on. So let's get back to, uh, I'm going to give you some nuggets of truth here to uh, help us in our spiritual growth. It is so easy to blame others when things don't go work out the way we want. You see that? To work out the way we want. That's the expectation. And even easier uh, to then demand that they apologize, apologize to us instead of taking responsibility of our own actions. You know, you know say, you owe me an apology. And that person say what? And if they're uh, in the faith, well, you might be able to work something out. But if they're in the world and they're a natural man, uh, that that probably is not going to happen, because it takes humility to say I'm sorry. But by, but by living a crucified life, remember the scripture. Hopefully, this is uh, you're bringing scriptures to your memory right now. Uh, reading the scripture, but by living a crucified life, we can take extreme ownership and control the outcomes we want to see happen. This also spins into resentment now. Resentment. Resentment and, and reaction are deeply inter interrelated. Resentment is an impassioned reaction. Remember the passions fell. The mind was darkened when Adam violated the commandments of God. Based on the judgment of a person or of the self, where our passions are ignited. And you can see that happen all around, all around us. Uh, look what's happening in the streets of the major cities. All the violence and all the looting and the burning that's going on. It's out of control. The passions are out of control. Resentment is a reaction which we hold within ourselves and allow ourselves to nurture it. It comes from and feeds off of our passions, which are fallen, from judgment of others. Resentment is judgment and objectification of a person according to his actions which have offended us. Well, he did this to me, he did that to me, so what? What's more important here? It's like a husband and wife having a scrap, a fight. I mean, think about it. You love that person? She loves you or you love her? Is it really worth going through all of that gyration of the blame game or, or that resentment? Is it really worth it? What is a better way to do is, is a pathway of escape by saying, it's my fault, I'm sorry, please forgive me. Those are very healing, positive words, if we can say them. The real key to resolving resentment is to realize that it is not the other person who is causing it, but that it is our own reaction. The actions of the other person may have precipitated the reaction, his words or deeds, his sin. But the reaction to those sins, words or deeds is purely our own. And by that we lose the peace of God. Did not Jesus say, my peace I give you, not as the world receives or understands, 
but my peace is, is way beyond the understanding the world has about peace, the peace of God. And I hope uh, you all listening to this video or listening to this radio show uh, understand that the most important thing is to stay in the peace of God and don't let anything rip it away from you because the devil doesn't want you at peace. Remember, he is the father of lies, and he wants to steal, kill, and destroy. He's an enemy of God. He's mad because Jesus Christ came here and redeemed us from, the, from sin and death. He's mad about that. And all of us who are following Christ and his teachings and loving one another, he hates. And so he's going to do everything to uh, turn the apple cart over and cause commotion. We can only control what belongs to us. See, that, that's where, you think about that. We can only control what belongs to us. We can't control somebody else. He reminds me of the, 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 your brother with a splinter in his eye, and you're trying to take the splinter out, and you've got a telephone pole sticking out of your eye. You can't even see, and you're trying to help him. Why don't you deal with what's going on with your life? It is our decision to allow ourselves to be possessed by our passions and reactions or to take control over our own lives. Do we not have the Holy Spirit indwelling us? Do we not have the power, the grace of God, the power of God in our lives to make the right decisions? And, and to not walk like the world walks, but walk the higher path, you know, the higher, the highway of holiness. That's what we're supposed to be on. And I was, there's, there's going to be a lot of uh, taking responsibility and taking ownership for what's going on in your life and not trying to blame somebody else for this. It is our decision to take responsibility for our own actions. And boy, does that need to happen. Or to allow ourselves to be caught, or allow ourselves to be caught in that vicious cycle of blaming the other person. It is a cycle. In resentment or self-righteousness. And that self-righteousness really stinks to God. I think as Isaiah said, our righteousness is as filthy rags unto the Lord. But the righteousness of God is totally something different. Blame and resentment lead nowhere. It is a dead end. And at the dead end, you're going to encounter bitterness and unhappiness. You want to go there? It's your choice. They make us into helpless victims, which in turn rob us of the power to take responsibility for ourselves. It becomes out of control. I knew a, a person one time uh, was, had an issue with another person and that person died and was buried. And this person who had an issue with that person went to the graveyard, the cemetery, and still cursed him, cursed at him in the grave. What good is that? What, what accomplished that? It's all, you see what I'm trying to say? It's you, not him or her. Resentment comes when we refuse to forgive someone, just in justifying ourselves by our self-righteousness, indignation about being hurt. Some of these hurts can be very deep. Abuse, abandonment, betrayal, or even rejection. That's the real world that we're living in. But remember, if you have Christ indwelling in you, then all that stuff can be cast away because you keep your eyes focused on the Lord Jesus Christ. The Lord of glory. Sometimes they can be very petty, some of these resentments. We keep turning the hurt over and over in our minds and refuse to let it go by justifying our anger. We justify our anger. But you think about what Adam and Eve did in the garden. They didn't wash with the Lord. They were kicked out. It was done. 
as the Lord dealt with the Israelites in Numbers 21. The grumbling and the blaming and carrying on in the wilderness, God had enough of it, and he sent fiery serpents to bite them. But when he saw the repentance, he provided a way of escape to the brass of that brown serpent. Now then when we feel justified in hating or despising the person who hurt us, doing this we continue to beat ourselves up with someone else's sin or compound the other person's sin by our own resentfulness. I hope you're getting what, what, I, what I'm trying to say here today about the blame game. It, it leads uh, to nowhere. It leads into a, a situation where you're going to say, woe is me. And, and you want to get, get, you want to get out of it, maybe by listening to this show today, that you can be free of, of that resentment and, and exhibit forgiveness. We blind ourselves to our own sin, focus only on the sin of the other. And in doing so, we lose all perspective. Isn't that true? We have to put things into perspective. It's like a camera lens. As you turn the focus ring, things become sharp and clear. And when you have it rolled back a little bit, it's fuzzy. But as you turn the focus ring, things become sharp and clear. We have to put things into perspective and realize that the other person's actions are only part of the equation. And that our own reaction is entirely our own sin. And some of you don't want to hear what I got to say. But maybe in time you will. Now to do this, we have to move towards forgiveness. To forgive does not mean to justify the other person's sin. It does not mean that we absolve the other person, not hold them responsible for their sins. Rather, we acknowledge that they have sinned and that it hurt us. But what do we do with that hurt? If we resent, we turn it against ourselves. But if we forgive, we accept the person for who he is, not according to his actions. We drop our judgment of the person. We realize that he is a sinner just like me. Remember, everybody you encounter are all a creation of God. We all are a creation of God. Some are doing wicked things. Some are doing righteous things. Some are doing good things. Some are doing bad things. But we're all a creation of God. And the whole thing focuses on you. How are you going to possess your vessel? That's what I'm trying to get at. How are you going to possess your vessel? So, we have to be honest with ourselves. You have to be aware of my own sin. And most of us, I think, are aware of our sins. I can never judge anyone because it says in the scripture, if you judge others by that same measure, you will be judged. So it's be better for you just to leave people alone and judge yourself only we can begin to love him as we love ourselves and that's one of the part of the world commandment and excuses falling short as we forgive ourselves he probably doesn't even know he's doing it he or she is doing it because they may be blind to that it helps when the person who is who hurt us asks for forgiveness but it, it is not necessary if they don't, it's okay, as long as you do, because what's your what's your personal relationship with Christ worth? Is it worth more than that? Because you can short circuit that immediately. We must always forgive, always. No negotiation with that. Not only because God forgave us, right, while we were still sinners but also because we hurt ourselves by refusing to forgive. Our res resentments can also be extremely petty. Sometimes we resent because we cannot control or manipulate someone to behave according to our expectations. We should have no expectations. None. But we do because of our fallen passions 
Uh, or the, the, the dar darkened of the noose, as it says in Scripture, our noose was darkened. The, the noose, the, the, the soul. We become resentful of our own frustration. Where the other really had nothing to do with it. All of our expectations of other people are projections of our own self-centeredness. If we can let other people simply be who they are and rejoice in that, then we have tremendous peace. And remember, I talked about that. Don't let anybody steal your peace, godly peace. Don't let anybody steal it. Because if Satan wants you to not be in peace, he wants you to always be flailing around. We have to be watchful over ourselves so that we do not allow ourselves to project our expectations on others or allow resentment to grow within us. This kind of awareness, watchfulness, is nurtured by the practice of cutting off our thoughts and practicing inner stillness. And those words, when I read those words, it reminds me of, of uh, John the Ladder, the, the steps of the ladder. Uh, it's always good to go look at that. There's a book out, you can read the book about the, the Ladder of Divine Ascent uh, by John Klamakos. But th those are some of the steps within the ladder. By this we practice cutting off our reactions, which all start with thoughts. We can come to see what is our own reaction and what belongs to the other. Eventually, we see that our judgment of others is really about ourselves. Our own actions, words and attitudes and temptations which we see reflected in the other person, it's like looking into a mirror. This is uh, to face this, to look in this mirror, is to face our own hypocrisy. <clears throat> hypocrisy. Well, am I a hypocrite? We need to change. If we judge and condemn someone for the same sins, thoughts, words, and deeds that we ourselves, then we are hypocrites. We must repent from our hypocrisy. This is real repentance. This is the key of real repentance, not going through the motions. To recognize and acknowledge our own sin and to turn away, turn away from it towards God and towards our neighbor work out our salvation with fear and trembling says the scriptures now we have to see how our sins distract us from loving our neighbor is that one of the great commandments and from loving god our love of our brother is the criterion of our love of god saint john tells us how can we love god whom we have not seen if we can't love our neighbor who we can see, even though they may be disgusting and sinful, and, and there you go. If you're not, if, hopefully you're paying attention to what I'm saying here. Uh, they're all a creation of God. They may be some of them off the track, but worry about yourself. Don't worry about them. If you say that you love God and hate your, your brother, you are a liar, saith the scriptures. If we love God, then we will forgive our neighbor as God has also forgiven us. That's very important. Give me the keys of the kingdom here today. The conscious awareness of our own reactions and judgments of our attachment, attachment to our passions of anger and our own will is the first level of spiritual awareness and watchfulness. And I go back and repeat, read St. John, the Ladder of Divine Ascent. We have to move beyond self-centeredness to become self-aware, aware of our own inner processes through watching our thoughts and reactions. We need to be, we, we need to be aware of what's going on and, be, and, and beat the devil at his own game. He's trying to 
take us uh, take us down. Uh, you know, uh, those of us who are following Christ, he he wants he wants to come after us and and uh, you know sift us like wheat. Awareness of our sins and hypocrisy, our shortcomings and falls, leads us to repentance, and by that we have the transformation of our life. How many want that? It's like you come up to the door uh, and you have a, to have a breakthrough and you can't get through the door because you can't transform your life because you're still dealing with this uh, not truly repenting. Repentance, conversion, the transformation of our mind and our life is the core of the Christian life. Repentance does not mean to beat ourselves up for our sins or to dwell in a state of guilt and morose and morass self-condemnation. Rather, it means to confront our sins and reject and renounce them and confess them, trying not to do them again. What this does is to the extent we renounce and confess our sins, they no longer generate thoughts which accuse us or spur passionate reactions. Memory. Isn't that amazing? God has given us a memory, but we keep going down the same path that turns into a wagon, a wagon rut. And that memory, we got to ask the Lord to, uh, to heal our memory, to to fill in those 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 ruts, and, and fill those in with the love of Christ. You know, we need to heal those memories, so we don't keep going back because memory becomes vicious circle. Sometimes we have to confess things several times. Because we only repent of, are only even conscious of, aspects of the sin. Things that make us feel guilty, provoke our conscience, or that we know our acts of disobedience should all be confessed. Don't hold anything back because, you know, I heard a story one time that uh, uh, this guy cleaned his house up and the Lord came to the house and everything looked spick and span except he went to the closet, opened the door, and out rolled a bunch of skeletons. So that's what the, well, you can't fool the Lord. He's the king of hearts. So we have to train our conscience, <coughs> not by memorizing a list of sins, but by becoming aware of what breaks our relationship with God and other people. We need to be conscious of God's presence and realize what distracts us from it. And so if, if it's going to, you know, the Lord Jesus Christ never wanted to be out of communion with his Father. He gave up food and sleep to be in prayer and communion with his Father. These things, uh, you know, if you don't have God consciousness, it'll distract. You'll be distracted. And these things are sins. Of course, we are experts of deluding ourselves. Okay, that's part of our hypocrisy. When we really want to do something and we know that it is not blessable. So, you know, there you go. You get, you, you, you're at the crossroad again of saying, will that break my relationship with God? And if it does, is it worth it? It's not. Confession is not only Christ's first gift to the church, the authority to forgive sins in his name, but is one of the most important means of healing our souls. Sins are not sin because they are a list, listed in a book somewhere. They are sin because they break our relationship with God, other people, and distort our true self. What is sin to somebody is, may not be sin to you, but something that's sinful to you may not be a sin uh, to them and break that relationship with God. So that's why we can't go blaming, do this blame game thing. Well, sins are sin because they hurt us and other people. We need to heal that hurt. And revealing the act or thought or attitude takes away the shame that keeps it concealed and prevents healing. We need to confess the things that we are the most ashamed of. The secret sins which we know are betrayals of our true self. If we don't confess them, they fester and generate all sorts of despondency, depression and guilt, shame and despair. See, there, those are keys to the kingdom right there. This, this steps and process. And all this comes out of Holy Scripture, the epistles and the Gospels. 
The result of, of that is that we identify ourselves with our sins. For example, same-sex attraction becomes gay identity. Failure in some area becomes a general self-identification with being a failure. What is critically important is that we are not our sins, thoughts or actions. These things happen. We sin. We have bad thoughts and do wicked and evil things, but we are not but we are not our thoughts or actions. Repentance means to stop and renounce not only the actions, but to renounce the identity that goes with it. I hope you heard that. Who are you in Christ? What's your identity in Christ? Thoughts are going to come. But we can learn through practicing inner stillness. That's another tidbit from St. John of the Ladder of Divine Ascent to let our thoughts go. They will still be there, but we can learn not to react to them and eventually simply to ignore them. It's like uh, St. Paisio said, thoughts are like airplanes. They fly over heads all the time. But when you start to, ooh, when you start to focus on the airplane, then your mind becomes a landing strip for those thoughts. The process of purifying our soul is hard and painful at first, but becomes a source of great joy. The more we confess honestly and nakedly, the more we can open ourselves to God's grace and the lighter we feel. Truly the angels in heaven and the priest standing for your bearing witness to the confession rejoice immensely when a person truly repents, confesses their sins, no matter how dark and heinous. There is no sin that's not forgivable. Okay? He forgives. God forgives. Remember, 70 times 7, Jesus talked about that. So, preparing for com uh, confession is a very important process. It means to take stock of our life and to recognize where we have fallen and that we need to repent. It is a more, it's an examination of our conscience. That's what it is. An examination of our conscience. Now, before I close, I want to say this. Do not return evil for evil, for God is the avenger of evil. It'll heap coals upon their heads, as scriptures tell us. We are not to respond like the world does. We are to take the high road every time. And it's okay to say, I'm sorry, and to apologize. The wrong attitude is, I'm waiting for your apology. That's the wrong attitude. Attitude is the key. Be those attitudes that Jesus talked about in the Beatitudes. Humility is the key. God says, I will give grace unto the humble. We have to be responsible and accountable. Remember who you are. You are a child of God and act accordingly. In the name of the Father and of the Son and of the Holy Spirit. Amen. for listening to the Ogladsome Light Podcast. We hope this program has encouraged you to fight the good fight of faith and walk in the accordance with the commandments of our Lord. May God bless you on your journey to salvation. Christ,